Hey everybody, welcome to Earth Day 365's Green Your Home program series, all about how to make your home a little bit more sustainable and, and do some green practices. And this is the way that we're going to start off Plastic Free July, uh, coming up to you through the Eco Challenge program. We'll put a uh, link in the chat box for you to see how that's going to work. And we're also screening the story of plastic. So you can get your link for that through our Eventbrite event. And we'll also put it, that in the chat. And it's up on our website as well. So really looking forward to spending some time with you. I'm up in uh, Vermont, remote, but I'll be mainly talking about the St. Louis, Missouri Regional Recycling Program. Uh, because that's one of the big issues that we have with recycling is that in our mobile society, we uh, go from municipality to municipality and the rules tend to change based on the strength of the recycling program in that area. Luckily in St. Louis, Missouri, we have a very strong recycling program that collects six different items. But here where I am up in Vermont, they only collect the main five recycling items, glass bottles, paper, cardboard, aluminum and metal cans and plastic. And we're gonna be breaking out of the plastic box today in this event program. So I'm really glad you're here. And I'm coming to you live from my friend's recycling cabinet in which let's just take a look how my friends do their recycling and see how they, they are doing. Oh, a glass bottle, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everybody. This is what usually most people do is they have a little cabinet, they have a, a bin, and look at how great these guys are doing. They've got a paper sack filled with all kinds of different paper, and they put that plastic, that glass bottle inside there, and all their other cartons and containers, right? And this is what a lot of people do is they'll create a little stockpile spot inside their kitchen. And we're excited to spend some time up here with my cat friend. Let me get that cat on video because I know our views are gonna go up really big then, right? And so when we think about recycling, there's all these other kinds of objects that really shouldn't go in there. And we're gonna talk about the stick with the six recycling campaign and how, and some of the things that people get confused on that they wanna put in recycling, right? Like they say, we should have paper in there. So they wanna put all kinds of paper like this paper towel, right? Or this paper napkin, right? And this kind of stuff isn't the paper that's gonna be useful for a paper pulp manufacturer to make another paper product out of. The fibers are too small, right? This is on its last leg. Plus this is used for somebody to uh, clean their mouth and clean up spills and it's gonna be wet and filled with food waste and the paper pulpers really don't want that, which is the same for a paper cup, right? Is that these are designed to carry food and they're also grease resistant. And so the food won't end up on our lap. But a lot of people think, hey, uh, paper, let me put that in there because that's what they want. But in order to make it grease resistant, they often have to put a chemical coating on here or even a plastic liner inside the paper cup to keep the food waste inside uh, the cup so it can make it to your mouth before it hits you on your lap. So even though we might say, yeah, paper, not all paper is appropriate to put in your recycling bin, right? The other things that people tend to do is they think about, oh, all kinds of uh, plastic, right? Big one is styrofoam. This is definitely a big no-no. It'll say like a number six plastic on the bottom maybe. Um, and this one's really hard to see. Um, but there's a the recycling symbol that talks about <clears throat> what kind of resin code it was. And styrofoam uh, will break up into a million different pieces um, and end up all over the recycling plant. So we wanna keep styrofoam like this in the cup form uh, and also in those packing peanuts that we have. Um, we definitely don't wanna do anything like that. So uh, other things that people do is, especially around the holidays, people get their plastic wire coated 
uh, Christmas lights and throw those in there along with like flexible film plastic, like this packaging strap that came off a, came off a package, right? And they'll throw that in there saying, hey, they want plastics. They must want all kinds of plastics. They must even want little lids like this. They must even want, you know, this kind of plastic, which is another way styrofoam comes to us, right? They must also want my utensil. Oh, that's a clear one. How about this one? This might show up a little bit better, right? Little utensils like that, plastic straws, right? All these things are plastic, but the system that was created to capture certain kinds of plastic recycling is not designed to handle any of these types of materials and especially plastic bags, which a lot of folks will put all the recycling into a plastic bag so that they can carry it out and put it in the recycling bin. What happens with this stuff is that it actually gets tangled up on all the gears and then the facility has to shut down. And it, that, those shutdowns cost the operation a lot of money, right? So these things like plastic bags, you know, uh, flimsy Ziplocs and uh, other kinds of strapping material, plastic strapping material, garden hoses are a big one that people tend to throw in there. Those get wrapped around and they're called tanglers. They tangle around the gearing, right? And that gearing is really important because it's a bunch of flexible discs that are rotating around and they help pop up things like flat cardboard, right? And that's gonna go up a conveyor belt, right? And it's gonna bounce up above while the three, the three dimensional bottles will fall downward, right? It's, very amazing engineering. And a lot of people don't understand how that works. But, uh, and so they're like, I can just throw all kinds of material and let the recycling facility handle it. But these materials like plastic bags and uh, tanglers, those are what's really driving the recycling industry nuts right now, causing a lot of problems for shutdowns, costing them a lot more money, all right? Other things that people tend to throw in are like, here's a, an envelope, right? But it has bubble wrap inside of it, right? Can you see that bubble wrap, right? So you got paper plus plastic glued to it. Now, a lot of people just don't quite understand that the plastic is going to one facility that might be say up in Minnesota and the paper is going to another place that's in Kentucky. Now, how are we supposed to figure out how to get these two pieces apart in the span of, you know, the 30 minutes, say, that the material's running through the plant, right? They're just trying to take a singular type of material, so they have to be just the paper, right? No plastic attached to it, right? And that happens with a lot of materials, and even uh, plastic like this, you know, a flimsy Plastic thing like this is not what their system is designed to handle, right? But a lot of people take, you know, anything that seems like plastic, like a little granola bar wrapper, a potato chip bag, they'll put all that in there. They'll, they'll take the lid off of their soda drink, right? And think that plastic can go in there. But look how flat this is, right? You see how flat that is? And now see how flat the cardboard is. That that plastic lid is going to be acting just like paper. So it's gonna end up contaminating a whole bale of cardboard, right? And you get thousands of these running through a facility, ending up in a bale of cardboard, right? That is called contamination right there. And the paper pulper is gonna say, I ordered a bale of cardboard. I did not order a bale of cardboard plus plastic send it back, right? And then that's where we get some of those issues where people start hearing about, you know, recycling being sent to the landfill, right? Um, because when you've shipped your bale of material all the way across the country to a facility and they reject it, it's gonna cost you a lot more money to ship it back, pull it apart, clean it up, 
get it to and then ship it back than it would just to landfill it. So they just call that a loss, right? <clears throat> now in St. Louis, Missouri, we are very fortunate to have an operation that keeps their bales really clean. They slow their, all the material comes in to a big tip floor, right? And everything just gets dumped onto the ground, picked up and then put into a conveyor line, right? And along those conveyor lines, it gets sorted mechanically, optically through laser technology, <clears throat> optical scanners, right? Um, maybe not exactly lasers, but optical scanners. Um, and hands, people on the lines will be trying to pick stuff off, right? They'll be trying to find stuff like this that is gonna hurt the machinery. They can't get everything, right? But they try and get all that off. And in St. Louis, Missouri, our recycling facility has slowed those things down so that you can uh, grab more contamination off the lines. But would they need to do that if people would just understand that we just want six different items and only those six, not some of these other pieces that people tend to confuse with the recycling, right? So we know that we want to have cardboard and we want cardboard to be flattened, right? That way, number one, it fits more into your recycling bin and that's the way it'll work best to get sorted at the facility. The other thing that we want um, is like something like a water bottle. This right here is what the facility was designed to capture, was a plastic water bottle, right? They also want, they also take uh, plastic cups, all right? But then we have different kinds of plastics being made out of organic materials. And so this is not the same type of plastic that this is made out of. It looks really similar and people confuse it all the time. But this needs to go to a composting facility where the organics, um, can be composted down and put back on somebody's garden, right? Because this is made out of like corn based material which breaks down through aerobic processing. So this, if you have this at home and no opportunity for that, it has to go into the pile for all of those other pieces of trash, right? Let's see, what else do we have over here? All right, we've got metal cans, right? The old tin can, right? That's perfect. This, they love this stuff. They just put a magnet into their, uh, along their conveyor belt and it gets sucked up and dropped off, right? So that's a great thing is the metal can. Um, aluminum cans, so they use a different kind of, uh, I don't know, it's like an eddy current, like an electrical eddy current, which actually propels the aluminum off of the conveyor belt, right? So where metal cans get sucked up, these uh, aluminum cans kind of get propelled off and get sorted off into, their aluminum bale, right? Plus we talked a little bit about the, the plastic bottles there, right? Um, aluminum foil, a lot of people are like, what to do with aluminum foil? Well, if you just put it in there flat, it's gonna end up like paper, right? Just like that plastic lid would. But if you can ball it up and make sure it's clean, no food waste in here, this is gonna have a much better chance because it's acting like this aluminum can on the conveyor belt right? And so it'll be able to get sorted. We talked a little bit about uh, different paper, right? So even with the plastic windows, this junk mail can go right into the recycling bin. We're happy to have that. We can get our um, paperboard type packaging um, and this can go into our, in with our paper. And if anybody is still, you know, reading um, a newspaper, you know, this can also be uh, put into your recycling. So that's, that's the paper stream right there. Office paper, uh, mailers, uh, packaging, stuff like that. Those are really important, right? So we got paper plus the cardboard plus the metal cans, right? So that's three, right? Then we've got the plastic containers, right? And then there's another area called the, the food carton, right? Or the aseptic material, 
like this little drink box right here, right? I love my coconut water. Woo! And after a hot day, um, you know, working outside, there's nothing more refreshing to me than getting a bunch of electrolytes through coconut water. Um, so, and you can just take this whole bin, this whole uh, package, and this one will also get uh, recycled, right? So, uh, <clears throat> that's what we got, right? Stick with the six. So we got paper, we got cardboard, we got aluminum metal cans, right? We've got um, the plastic, you know, uh, bottles like that. We've got the food cartons. And then when, what you saw right at the beginning, it was the glass bottle, right? It wasn't like window glass when you're like looking out, you know, you don't want to give that uh, kind of glass. You want something that was a, a soda bottle. And those are the six types of items that are really important for us uh, to recycle, right? So, so there you have it. My name's Bob Henkel. Maybe I got, I don't know if I have my video on. I should have some video here. All right. Uh, let me switch my camera around. There you go. Hey, there you are. Welcome to all you folks that are out here uh, coming and joining me today on this Green Your Home series. Um, I'll set you up here. Like I said, I'm up in uh, Vermont right now. So um, one of the things, the different things about uh, being up here in Vermont was they don't take this kind of aseptic uh, milk carton container in their recycling. But in St. Louis, Missouri, here in June 2020, <clears throat> Uh, our Republic Services Material Recovery Facility, it handles 80% of all of the recycling in the St. Louis region, right? They take stuff from the Illinois side and the St. Louis side. And they have optical scanners to sort for different grades of plastic. So number one is like this cup, right? Number two is like your laundry detergent bottle, right? Um, and then they also have an optical scanner to get these aseptic uh, containers, right? Uh, so they can sort those out. And this is different than up here in Vermont, they don't have that technology, right? <clears throat> um, the other thing that you can put in here would be like your milk carton, right? Uh, those are perfectly fine to put into your St. Louis, Missouri uh, recycling uh, bin, right? People are also asking, what about these kind of like yogurt containers, right? Uh, these are fine too. Um, so when they talk about plastic containers, uh, something like this, something like this uh, would be great. But if I could ask you all, the millions of you that are tuning in right now, I mean, it's just amazing to have this many viewers on. I uh, really appreciate all the enthusiasm interest that everybody's out there. If I could have you do one thing, right, when talking about plastic, just give them this water bottle, right? That'd be the only plastic item that, that you put in there. Any kind of beverage plastic water bottle. That's what the system was designed for, right? That would be great. And any kind of like detergent bottle, right? Those two things and throw all the other plastics away, the recycling industry would be super grateful for that, right? But instead, people think that every kind of plastic can, can go in there, right? So when they go to the store and all of a sudden you get, you know, your electric toothbrush and it comes in a, in a little container packaging like this, made out of plastic, people are like, oh, I'm gonna throw that in there, right? Or, you know, whatever was inside this piece of plastic. Well, Little technical difficulties there on my uh, remote stand. No worries. Um, so they have this kind of plastic too as well, right? Um, and people want to keep throwing this stuff in there, but this is not what the system was designed to handle. It was designed to handle the beverage container. And um, one of the main reasons why it was designed, designed to do that is because a lot of the recycling industry is pushed uh, by the beverage uh, industry, right? They're making all these beverages and they're trying to put a lot of education and a lot of 
uh, resources, um, not nearly enough, but into collecting uh, plastic bottles, right? That you guys eat, right? And drink. Um, so plastic, plastic packaging has been huge and it's really uh, taken over our grocery stores and, and outlets. Um, people are getting everything wrapped up in plastic, right? So we want to talk a little bit about, you know, plastic is just so pervasive. You know, what can we do to, um, you know, to reduce our, say, plastic footprint, right? One of the things that would be really important is on July 2nd, this Thursday, uh, join us here again. We're going to have a couple of great speakers, Lacey Cagle from the Eco Challenge and uh, some from Dutchtown South Community Corporation in South St. Louis City, uh, talking about the story of plastic. A fantastic film, really talking about what's happened with plastic in the last 15 years, right? Uh, it has just ballooned uh, into having so much different types of plastic in our life uh, that we just, you know, morally, we feel like let's not um, throw more stuff into the landfill. So we give stuff to the recycling industry, which then has to sort out and get what they were designed to get, right? And throw out the rest of the stuff, right? So when people say they're throwing away recycling, I think what they really are doing is they're throwing away the pieces of material that they can't sell on the market, right? Like they can find a market. In St. Louis, Missouri, most of our recycling stays in the Midwest, right? There's even there's, uh, plastic bottle um, manufacturers uh, for this number one plastic, number two type plastic. Those are here in the Midwest. They're right here in the States, right? All those other plastics, three through seven that people talk, you know, the polyvinyl, you know, this is polyvinyl chloride, PVC, right? One of the worst chemicals to burn, right? Off gas is really incredibly bad stuff, right? But we make stuff out of vinyl. We live behind uh, vinyl uh, siding, right? Not that I'm gonna say anything about it, but if you wanna live in a, in a place that's really just jet fuel surrounding the outside of your house, that's, you know, that's up to you. Um, but, you know, I love the old St. Louis brick houses, you know, make me feel really good, right? Just surround me with rock. Um, so one of the things I think about is, um, you know, I start doing a, a program like this and I get thirsty and, and I could go, you know, for the water bottle or, I could have my own reusable water bottle. Very simple, very easy. Just refill this baby and just get refreshed all the time. And there's nothing better than good, clean water, I think, right? And if I wanted to do something fancy, I could, I could put it in my own little stainless steel cup with my reusable straw, right? Now they have these great ones with like little silicone tips on them. And so, you know, when you stick this up, you know, you don't like hurt your gum line, you know, Woo! I hate that. So, <clears throat> but there's nothing better than making yourself a nice little ice cream milkshake in here, you know, that's how I like it. And then just suck all the, all the juice right out of the bottom. Mm! Always irritated my sister. But, you know, having something like this on the go, right? Always a really good thing to have a reusable cup especially like this weekend, right? July 4th, a lot of people are gonna be barbecuing. I can tell all those red solo plastic cups are gonna be coming out. And the recycling industry doesn't want any one of those recycling, those number six plastic solo cups, right? There's barely any kind of market for that, right? Nobody is wanting to buy that type of plastic and, and reuse it, right? So but that's what we need to think about in this, this day and age, right? The other thing, um, thinking about, oh, this is always fun. Our Green Dining Alliance, that's our other sister program, you know, that uh, works with restaurants. Uh, we also sell, you know, reusable cutlery, you know, bring that, packs up easy, um, have that with you at all times, especially now with, you know, so much takeout being made, right, that it's really important to remember. And, and I, I've done this too, you know, it's like I've, I've 
forgotten to say, yeah, you know, hold, hold the ketchup. Right. And I got like a handful of these little ketchup packets. Right. I got a huge wad of napkins and then I got, you know, all that plastic cutlery. Right. And I'll tell you, you know, one of these things is going to make it through the recycling uh, in, uh, facility. And one of them is just going to fall through the cracks and end up going to the landfill. Right. So people put plastic cutlery in, into their recycling bin and it's not going to get recycled. It's not even good plastic. Right. It's made to be single use. Right. Same with this, the ketchup packets. I was like, oh, my gosh. So when I go to order, you know, I want to support my local restaurants, you know, the whole economy. You know, plus I just like a good burger every once in a while, pasture braised, you know, um, just, mm, it's just so delicious. Um, <clears throat> I have to remember, please hold the, hold the ketchup, you know, hold the, you know, I'll get a burger with everything, but hold the cutlery. So uh, then I don't have to deal with that, right? I take it home or I bring something from home, right? It doesn't take much. But it does take thinking in the head, and I know, I know, when we're all stressed out, um, how do we uh, think ahead, right? We can barely, you know, think behind. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like, this is kind of crazy times, right? So uh, it's important to make sure, you know, if you have a, a bag or something that you always carry with you, um, just, you know, hey, get 20 of these, you know, why not? You know, get 20 of these, stick them around in different places so they're always there, ready and available for you. I'm not trying to be a hard sell or anything, you know, but, you know, we could use a little bit of, uh, you know, a little extra support, you know. Um, no, I'm only kidding, you know, but I'm telling you, these are really good. You ought to get a set. People love them. Um, the other thing to do, um, this is kind of crazy, right? So COVID-19 hits and it's just been a disaster for so many in, in our community, you know, losing jobs, you know, losing their lives. It's just real, real struggle. And the plastic industry, um, I was just reading an article on uh, Grist talking about the CDC is finding that the transmission rate is not really happening from surface contact, right? That's not how we're getting uh, the disease spread, right? But the plastic industry was like, hey, this is uh, really important. We're gonna have a much safer life if you keep using plastic bags to the grocery store. Um, you know, use more plastic in your life. Uh, that'll be really important, you know, to keep you safe. But the reusable bag is not what's gonna, uh, they say it's not what's gonna be transmitting the virus, right? And so uh, having some kind of, you know, some kind of, um, bag, you know, like something from our St. Louis Earth Day um, bags there from our website uh, and our merchandise uh, sales, you know, you can get the bamboo cutlery, you can get a nice bag like that. You know, what's this, like some big infomercial? I don't know, all right? We even have, uh, you know, stainless steel uh, insulated and they're insulated pint-sized cups there. So, hey, those are always there, right? But those are some things that, uh, we can do. Um, so that Grist magazine was talking about CEC um, and the whole reusable bag like is actually okay, right? Um, so check that out, you know, for yourself. Um, the other thing, you know, when I'm doing programs like this, you know, sometimes I just got to reach for, you know, the energy bar. You know, sometimes I just, it's, it's simple, it's convenient, it's, you know, it's all right there, you know, carbohydrates, sugars, gotta love it, right? But um, what if I took, say, 30 minutes to make some of these delicious babies, huh? Yeah, I got dates, apricots, almonds, mmm, mmm, mmm. This is some good cooking. Takes good care of me, takes good care of the earth, right? I feel really good about that. I just reduced my, my packaging, right? Of course, you know, my apricots came in a plastic bag, right? As did, oops, dropped out again, right? As did my dates, right? Came in a plastic bag, right? And then I got to repackage them for the trail in a plastic bag, right? But I got to tell you, these little babies are a lot more delicious <clears throat> than this thing.
Um, and I feel really proud of, really proud. I wish I could share these with you. I really do. I really do. Um, but anyway, um, those are some things, you know, doing a little cooking at home, right? Making some, some stuff, putting things in like a reusable, you know, even if it's plastic, I totally get that. Uh, I'd love to be doing uh, stuff and carrying things like in glass, right? When I was a kid, we used to get milk delivered in glass bottles, right? And then we send them back to the dairy and bring them back, right? Um, now everything, you know, now we are, we're surrounded by plastic and how can we uh, do better? I think one of the biggest things uh, to focus on is put the right kind of plastic in the recycling bin, right? The stuff that the recycling industry wants and it's a commodity and it drives the economics, right? Um, that's, that's important. But you know what's even more important? And the thing I would like to really bring forth is let's just reduce, right? We have reduce, reuse, and then recycle, right? We can't get rid of recycling yet, right? We got too much stuff. To, there's resources. There's, a, um, there's material in here that we don't want to do extraction and extraction and extraction from the environment, right? And keep polluting, right? So if we can get the right stuff through our recycling system, it does reduce pollution. It reduces uh, environmental damage through the extraction of, of raw materials, right? Um, it does create jobs. There's economic value. So not only do you need to get this bottle recycled, right? But then um, you also need to, you know, buy stuff with recycled content, you know, like this t-shirt, for instance, right? It is uh, recycled content, you know, polyester basically from water bottles, right? And, um, you know, felt pretty good, you know, this is what I use for my staff t-shirt, right? If I really wanted to, but then, you know, I've got my hat. This thing's all made out of plastic, right? That's there. What am I wearing around my ears, you know? It's like I got plastic coated wire, you know? But I can have some agency over managing how much material flow I'm, I'm going. And if I'm gonna buy material that has recycled content, you know? Someone like uh, a Walmart can demand that their yogurt containers have at least 30% recycled content. And that goes through every Walmart in the world, right? Just one package making that kind of specification um, can really boost the, the entire recycling operation to make thing, sure that things are, are um, in kind of a circle, right? I know that, especially for plastics, it's kind of like downcycling, right? Eventually, we aren't gonna be able to recycle that piece of plastic, right? It's gonna end up as a zip tie or some sort of coating material or you know something else that we can't turn into another product, right? So it's kind of pushing things uh, down the road, shall we say. And some people argue that we shouldn't do recycling, but reusing material and recycling are really important in the sustainability triangle, right? First thing we gotta do is refuse to grab stuff that we don't need necessarily. Can we make a little, you know, do we have in ourselves and have a little extra effort? And I know that thousands, thousands of you that are watching this uh, episode, you know what it means and you, you don't want to throw stuff to the landfill. You know, it's part of your moral character as a good citizen, right? And, and steward of the environment, right? We feel good and we're like, we don't want to send stuff to the landfill, but we end up with this stuff through just our daily lives, right? So let's make sure we recycle the correct six items, mixed paper, and we talked about what that newspaper, the paperboard, you know, junk mail, office paper, right? The cardboard, we talked about that, that's really important. Um, and make sure cardboard is flattened. How many people have gotten like a new TV or a new electronics or something packaged, you know, sent from, I don't know, say Amazon, right? Um, and it's packaged with like either plastic air, air bubble stuff in there, or it's got uh, hard foam plastic, you know, styrofoam in there. So people tend to put all that packing material back in the cardboard box and throw the whole thing into the recycling dumpster. 
and it's the styrofoam that's inside there. It's that plastic wrap. It's like a tangler. It gets around all the gears, right? We have to pull all that stuff out, throw that stuff in the trash, right? Our landfills will be okay for now, right? Um, we got plenty of land. Um, so um, we want to make sure that it's just the cardboard that's going in there, right? We want to talk about the glass bottles, right? And anything that had food or uh, liquid in it, it should be empty, right? You know, this, this yogurt container is done, right? It's fine. You know, none of this yogurt, you know, slop is, you know, it's all dried up now. It's, I've been using this sample for, I don't know, about five years now. Um, woo, boy, that's good. And so, um, you know, this kind of thing could be all right. Oh, look at this. I just looked on, on here. This is a polystyrene number six, right? After six years, I finally actually looked at what it was made of. Usually these things are made of uh, polypropylene, number uh, five plastic. Boy, even now, you know, I can learn something new, right? So let's get curious out there. Let's figure out what it is that we're really uh, throwing in there. When I came up to Vermont, I had to uh, Google search, what are the rules and guidelines for recycling in this area? Because um, my friend, he's just, you know, he's been too crazy. He's like, you know what gets me is, it's the milk carton. I don't know. Can I put those things in there? I'm, I'm going to throw it in there um, and let them deal with it. Um, and I look it up and it's like, nope, they don't want that in recycling, right? So trying to be a little curious and really figure out what are the six things that we need to get rid of. Mixed paper, flattened cardboard, aluminum metal cans, glass bottles. Um, make sure everything is empty. There's no extra liquid in there. Um, plus the food cartons, right? The food cartons. Um, I'll talk a little bit about at the material recovery facility. We call it a MRF, um, M-R-F, material recovery facility. Um, I talked about optical scanners. So this bottle is gonna be going across a conveyor belt. And then it gets to a scanner, like a big Cyclops machine, you know, or something, you know, it's, and it's looking at that and it's reading this uh, resin through the light that's being transmitted through and, and reflected back, right? And when it discovers that it has a number one type plastic, PET, our friend Pete, right? It wants Pete, right? Hey, wouldn't you want Pete? I always pick Pete to be on my team, you know? Hey, Pete, you're on my team, right? So we get Pete, right? Pete's going to be coming along here. Then the conveyor belt, it shoots a puff of air from underneath. And this bottle just gets poof, popped up off of the conveyor belt and into a bunker. Meanwhile, if it sees something like this pla plastic packet, right, or something that it doesn't want, like this number six polystyrene cup, right, that one's just going to fall straight down. But the number one goes up and over. And the, so you get both of these things, like one's going to go up, one's going to go down, right? And that's the amazing mechanical uh, engineering feat that is our recycling industry right now. So we love having that. I love having you all out there. If uh, anyone has any questions, I would love uh, to hear that, hear them about anything in particular. Hopefully this has uh, been helpful to you. And um, Gives you some idea around, you know, breaking out, breaking free of the um, of the plastic box, right? <clears throat> you know, short story, short story. I know um, some of my stories aren't that short, but this one is, you know, so a couple years back, um, I was at the Green Ball. It was thrown by our friends over at the Earthway Center, a uh, division of the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And it was a costume party for, you know, there's a lot of sustainability stuff and, you know, how can you be, you know, the most sustainable, right? <clears throat> and people were dressing up in uh, some really fun uh, costumes, right? And uh, there was a woman who was in a outfit, a dress that was made by, uh, from New Yorker magazines. I mean, just a beautiful gown all made out of uh, New Yorker magazines. And another woman, she spent like 1,500 hours um, making um, 
cordage out of honeysuckle, you know, the, the plant that is totally invading all of our uh, right of ways and our forests um, is, is devastating a lot of the native populations, right? Um, so she made this beautiful dress out of honeysuckle. Um, and those two were uh, finalists, as was I a finalist for my rendition of wearing a black plastic backyard composter bin, right? So I had it wearing as if I was in a barrel, right? And, uh, and it was beautiful. In fact, if you look online, you might see a, see a photo of me in that black plastic box there, right? And people would come up to me and they kind of confused the idea of like recycling and composting, right? And we talked a little bit about that um, with some of those materials like this greenware cup that is made out of corn and uh, is designed to go into a municipal composting uh, facility, right? Because in order for this to break down, it needs higher heat than what you can usually get in your backyard. Your backyard, if you're lucky um, and really work in it, um, and you can get a lot of uh, grass clippings, nice green, high nitrogen, uh, grass clippings and add those to your compost pile in your backyard, you will get more heat, maybe get up to maybe 140 degrees, you know, but even that is not going to uh, hit this. You need to get up over 150. Um, you know, it might melt a little bit. I've seen people, uh, vendors at different festivals, they put their, their cups out uh, on their table, you know, and then the sun hits it all day long. And next thing you know, people are getting cups that are, you know, all kind of, a little bit melted. Um, Speaking of backyard composting, Bob, Dan, Jay would like you to talk about composting a little bit. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about composting right now. Great. So, um, so we're talking about uh, the difference between the backyard and a municipal composting facility, right? So this kind of to-go ware, utensils, things that you might get at a restaurant, uh, for takeout um, really needs to go into a municipal compost facility that has really big piles. They get them really hot, um, designed to break down the weed seeds, um, all kinds of different uh, materials, uh, organic materials, right? These kind of cups um, and stuff like that, right? In your backyard compost, you really want to focus on your fruit and vegetable scraps, right? Um, and that's the main thing. You really don't want to put like meats and dairies and, and high fat oils and stuff uh, in your backyard compost. Um, but um, as we take a look at how to reduce our waste going into a landfill, recycling is a great strategy. We talked a lot about recycling today. And then dealing with our food waste. That's the next big item that's really important to reduce our waste going to our landfills, right? So if you're really concerned about, you know, landfill waste and not wanting to put stuff in the landfill, um, I would urge you, I would urge you so much to throw away all that plastic that nobody, nobody wants, right? Um, and focus on how can I deal with food waste, right? Because the food going into a landfill is going to off gas methane. And they can't capture all that methane. It ends up in the atmosphere, increasing greenhouse gas effect, increasing uh, global climate change, right? Methane, <clears throat> the other big, you know, one of the largest uh, ways methane gets out is through cow burps. Um, yeah, can you imagine being the scientist that had to figure out which end of the cow was producing more uh, methane? Um, but uh, they figured out it was actually the, you know, they were burping out a lot of methane. <clears throat> so, um, so that's another thing, man. If you get somebody, hey, stop your burping, you know, that's climate change right there, buddy. Um, so uh, might be a way to approach it. I don't know, you know. But uh, let's see, what else we want to talk about with uh, composting? Um, fruit and vegetable scraps, really important. Um, I've got one of those black plastic bins in my backyard. Um, and I just went over to the nursery and I got myself a bale of straw. It cost me like, I don't know, 10, 12 bucks or something like that. And so I can put 
all my kitchen scraps, um, you know, and I can put those into under the pile inside the plastic bin. And then I can sprinkle it with a little bit of uh, straw. That helps keep some air in there. As soon as you have, um, it's gonna smell more when there's less oxygen being able to get into the pile, right? Um, a lot of people don't think like, do I need to turn this thing? Do I need to turn this thing over and over? You know, um, dude, man, I really appreciate comfort. I, I move to comfort wherever I can and I try not to do more than I need to, like energy efficiency. I learned that from the fox. I learned that from the owl, you know. They are out there fighting for their lives, right? They can't waste energy just by running around. But now I'm up here in Vermont. I'm working uh, with a bunch of nine-year-old boys. And uh, these kids just like feel like energy is like an infinite commodity, right? So um, they just keep going at it. But when we think about composting, you don't need to turn it. I mean, it, the turning creates more oxygen, right? And then it'll break down faster. But if it's just you and your house with your own vegetables, right? Your own fruits, right? That black bin, you can keep dumping stuff in there for years. Most of the food waste is going to have a lot of water in it. All right. And so most of that water is just going to dissipate, drain down. There's hardly any structure to it. And so even though you might build up a bunch of fresh fruit, you know, after two weeks, that stuff's like down like this. Right. And then you just build up again. You know, right. Right. And it just, uh, you know, you're like, where is it all going? There must be gophers under, under there, you know, you know, pulling stuff down. But really, it's just the water waste leaving. Right. And so, but if you also add a little uh, straw or something high in carbon, and carbon is what makes the structure, you know, that way we can actually, you know, like in my bones, you know, otherwise I'd be like, you know, uh, all collapsed, right? Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about this, right? Good thing I just collapsed myself, I just saw this. So uh, I will get to this secret thing you got to stay tuned just another couple minutes and i'll i'll be right there with the most amazing piece of educational knowledge around recycling it's brilliant y'all gonna be like what right so uh yeah so backyard create yourself a pile it's good to keep it covered um you know you, you want to keep you know other animals from finding it and and adding it um around there but you know uh sometimes that isn't such a bad idea um, I always made sure I had a lot of straw over the top of my uh, compost pile because it reduced odors and made it uh, less of a nuisance, right, for anybody, right? <clears throat> um, and I know that there's a, there's a composting facility in town that is having some issues with nuisance smells uh, with the neighbors, and I really hope that they're all able to work that out. Um, I think that's perennial city composting. They offer you the ability to get a bucket at your house, put your vegetable scratch in there. They'll pick it up so you don't have to manage anything uh, on your own property, right? Um, BLH Farm is another residential composting uh, program, which gives you a little bucket, and then you pay them a weekly fee, and they'll pick up residential composting for you right um, and take that so there's a couple uh, ideas around residential composting um, but follow up with the farm and make sure that you're giving them some resources to an operation that you believe in in what they're doing right and that they're working for the community uh, we work with st louis composting and their total organics recycling program uh, um, drops off yellow compost totes at restaurants and schools around the, around the region and they run, you know, 600,000 um, cubic yards, I believe, of compost per year. Um, just huge amounts of compost that they create. They bring food waste and um, even like leftover uh, expired stuff from the grocery stores. They can squeeze out the yogurt and get rid of the plastic container and put the yogurt into their mix, right? So they have a depackager um, in composting. So... There's a lot of cool stuff going on uh, out here in the uh, in our 
trying to reduce waste to landfill through composting and through recycling. Hopefully that answered that. Um, we've got a couple more minutes here, but I want to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> so the plastic bottle, right? Look at how, look at that shape. You know, that's pretty good, right? It's pretty round, three dimensional. But as soon as you, that thing down, right? you know, they turn it, you know, flat like this. Now you just, instead of making a plastic bottle, you made a plastic piece of paper, right? And this is gonna go through the recycling facility like paper, right? And especially, um, and nobody wants this in the paper, right? They don't want this kind of stuff. So don't crush your materials, right? Keep them in their three-dimensional form as much as possible, right? Um, but as soon as you try and crush your plastic bottle, a lot of people will put like napkins and stuff and just, they'll stuff all kinds of junk. Once you stuff anything else in here, this has to go to the trash, right? Because it's no longer just the plastic, right? And people are like, well, what about the cap? What about the cap? I was like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you could throw the cap away, put it in the trash, that'd be fine. But if you put it in the recycling bin, by itself, it will not get recycled, right? But if you put it on the bottle, it will end up going to a plastic recycling facility and, and be able to get recycled that way, right? These things will get shredded up, pelletized, um, washed out, everything. The thing that they want is make sure there's no liquid in here that makes it too heavy for a puff of air to pop it off the recycling system right, off the conveyor belt, right? So plastic containers should be empty and easily recognizable for um, recycling that way. Hopefully uh, this has been useful. Um, really appreciate you all being here. Um, this has been, question. we got any more questions coming in? Um, can we crush cans? Uh, you can crush cans because those are gonna be taken out by the metal. Um, thing but it's better um it's going to be easier to get through the first layer the first system that the facility goes through is to sort out the cardboard and the paper from all the containers right and so if the cardboard is flat keep the container round right and uh they'll be able to sort out one's going to go down the other one's going to go up right and if you haven't watched um how a facility operates, check out in our virtual festival page the, um, and on our YouTube channel, the tour that um, we hosted with the Republic Services Material Recovery Facility and Brent Batline, or their general manager. Um, we had a great experience um, with him walking us through his plant. Um, and showing us the entire operation. So you'll be able to see a lot of the different pieces that I've been talking about. Uh, he even does the thing with the plastic bottle and says, here you go, I'm putting it on the belt. And uh, you see the puff of air popping off. Um, watching stuff like that can really help, help out. And now that you've, you know, the millions of you that have tuned in today and are watching this, um, you know, it's your citizen uh, obligation to help bridge the gap with other people in the, in the knowledge gap area, right? Um, see yeah, something, say question. something. Another what else? Question. Um, another question? What about cardboard and metal mixed cans? Oh, like uh, Quaker Oats, right? And your, um, or like anything that, uh, like, uh, yeah, one of those kinds of containers, I'm guessing, right? That if you have, when you have two different types of material, metal versus paper, and they're sandwiched together, those are not going to go, they're not going to be able to go to the two different places in the United States. Um, they're going <clears> to, <throat> we don't want to do that, right? So we want to throw those things that are mixed metal and paper, those have to be thrown away, right? And this is what happens. I get a lot of people that are like, oh, I recycle everything. And I have to say, oh, please don't, right? I really appreciate that you you know, want to keep stuff out of the landfill, but the recycling facility was designed for certain types of material and it's sorting it by that single type of material, right? The aluminum, 
you know, the plastic, the metal, right? The aseptic container, right? What else do I got? Oh, the glass bottle, right? But as soon as you start mixing things together, um, and you might be going, hey, Bob, I got you, I got you, gotcha. There's paper on the, on the metal can. You know, what about that? And I was like, yeah, you're right. You got me. Um, didn't tell you that this metal can is gonna go to a furnace at like 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so pretty sure the paper is just gonna go, Poo, right? Not a problem, right? Not gonna be a problem. Um, and don't worry about, you know, like the paper, wrap, plastic paper wraps things that are around um, plastic bottles either. That's not an issue for the manufacturer to deal with. Um, Kathy would like to know, is this okay even if you separate the parts like cutting off the bottom of the material? So if you, if you want to give them the metal, um, I would suggest that when you don't have a beverage can that is three-dimensional like this, right? Um, that it was, it is more designed to go to a local scrap metal dealer than to go to our recycling facility. The metal lid that you, you know, pull off of the can opener, um, I'm sure a lot of that stuff gets caught by, um, if it makes it into the um, conveyor belts, right? And doesn't fall through some cracks into the residual trash pile before it gets there. The magnets will pick up flat metal like that. Um, but this is what they're designed to handle, right? This is it, the round thing, right? Um, we can get really nitpicky around that. The biggest thing that recyclers still today say, don't give us your tanglers. Don't give us you know, uh, garden hoses, plastic bags, um, gar uh, holiday lights, you know, anything that can wrap around, you know, all that plastic filmy stuff, right? That acts like paper, but is plastic. Get rid of that first, right? Then they might come back and give us more feedback. I mean, feedback is, is really useful to, to us as humans. That's how we learn, that's how we grow, right? The first step is let's get rid of all the tanglers, you know, no styrofoam, no plastic bags, um, keep that out. Uh, that'll help clean up the recycling industry, help them feel uh, like they're able to make uh, some stuff out of that. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, our focus needs to be yeah. Plastic Free July and the Eco Challenge and the story of plastic one more time. So uh, yeah, it's Plastic Free July coming up. Um, and in honor of that, we have um, about 400 links available, uh, viewings available of the story of plastic. It's from the Story of Stuff project. And um, you can go to our Eventbrite, um, register for the screening. We'll send you a confirmation email with the link uh, to watch the film on your own. You know, learn on your own, you know, take some notes, join us on Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Central Time, Thursday, July 2nd, 2020, that uh, you'll be joining us, uh, Lacey Cagle with the Eco Challenge, um, and a member of the Dutch Town South Community Corporation. It could be uh, Carissa uh, Gilman Hernandez, who is uh, running their So Fresh, So Clean program, or Amanda Colin Smith, who is uh, the Executive Director of Dutch Town. Um, we're gonna have a great discussion um, we're going to work through uh, just the reactions that people are having to this this film about the story of plastic, um, and uh, really looking forward to seeing folks there on Thursday, July second, five thirty p.m. Central Time. Anything else? I think that'll do it. All right. Well, this has been wonderful, folks. I'm really. As usual, I just love hanging out with you, um, me and my millions of fans. Uh, you guys are all brilliant. No, I really appreciate y'all being here. Um, we're going to have this thing recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to uh, share this to others if you thought it was useful uh, for yourself and you think others will find this uh, useful too. So uh, thanks so much for being here. You all take care. Bye-bye.